Okay, folks. So hello, Algonquin College community. Thank you so much for joining us today. So my name is Samantha, and I work on the AC Hub events team here at Algonquin College. And I am joined with my colleague, Quinn, from the Students Association. And we'll be hosting this event today. And we just want to say thank you so much for joining us. So before we get started, I'm going to go over a few housekeeping items. To stay connected to the Algonquin College community, be sure to tune in to our other events that you can find through the AC Hub and the Students Association events calendars, which we'll share in the chat now. Today's event is equipped with closed captioning if you need it. To turn on closed captioning, press the CC icon across the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. And Jocene, oh folks, this event is being recorded and the recording will be available to, available, excuse me, to watch on the AC Hub on-demand website in the coming days. And again, we'll share a link to that in the chat now. And there will be a Q&A session towards the end of this event. So you can add the, your questions to the Q&A tab throughout. And uh, before we introduce Mallory and Josh, I'm gonna ask an icebreaker question for you to answer in the chat. <laughs> the question is, what do you spend the most amount of money on? Ooh, this is a tough question. Quinn, what would you say you spend the most money on? Uh, I mean, I think rent is, is the big one for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely yeah. rent. I would say rent and like utilities. And then after that, lots of people are saying food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely food. Coffee, find, like, Starbucks. Oh, coffee, yeah. Starbucks, food. Yes, me too, food. It's just too easy with Uber Eats and all of these like apps and like the charges, they add up. Yes, yeah, gas mm -hmm. is really expensive these days. It's crazy gas. Does anyone use the bus? I found the bus is so expensive lately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, life is expensive. It's so hard. Okay. Well, thank you for your answers, guys. Okay. So folks, I now have the pleasure of introducing you to, oh, wait, we have another. Okay. We have bus with UPass. I'm online student, which helps save a bit of money. Nice, Ashley. That's great. Okay, folks, so I have the pleasure of introducing you to Mallory Rowan and Josh Rays, also known as the in-betweeners. Mallory and Josh first got their taste of entrepreneurship as students when they launched LVD Fitness, which is a powerlifting apparel brand for the socially conscious athlete. They quickly grew it into a global operation with the top powerlifters in the world as brand ambassadors. Since then, Josh has become the number one social media realtor in Ottawa, two years in a row, and Mallory is a content creator, marketing educator, and Lululemon ambassador. That is so cool. And together they host the Inbetweeners, a YouTube channel that discusses money and wealth for everyday hustlers. So I just wanna say thank you so much, Mallory and Josh, for joining us today for this. And we're so excited to hear what you guys have to talk to us to, about today, about financial literacy, and take it away, folks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. We're excited. Uh, let me get our screen up. And I know they mentioned this in the chat, but also feel free to like chat throughout with um, us. We're pretty good multitaskers. So we are watching the chat and the Q&A. If there's anything that's like a clarifying question in the moment, feel free to just jump in and we can answer it. Um, we'll let you know if it's like a really big question and we can come back to it at the end. So no harm in throwing it out there if you're feeling a little confused at any point. So with that, we're pretty much going to dive right into it. So kind of a uh, meet in betweeners. We are money and wealth nerds for pretty much the everyday hustlers. We founded our first business as university students uh, when we were at Carleton. And now we have founded two other businesses, um, real estate and coaching. Um, our YouTube mainly find, uh, focuses on personal finance, real estate, and building a business. Those are just the topics that we know best and that we would like to share. Um, and you can find us through our social media handles uh, over there. Yeah, if you want to create more of our stories, you can find it on Instagram. So we're not going to waste your time with that. <laughs> so the first thing we want to mention is that the easiest way to get better with money is to actually enjoy getting better with money. So a lot of us for really valid reasons have icky feelings around money and a lot of your money experience is gonna be working through those, which isn't super fun news, but 
it really does teach you a lot about yourself and it really does open up doors for you. So for us, we really find that, you know, we could sit here for an hour and teach you definitions and, you know, what the stock market means and what's SMP, but we really want to focus on getting you guys started on your own financial journeys. And so to us, like we kind of have a different approach to financial literacy. So we're really excited to share that with you guys. And if you've already, like, I'm curious, let me know in the chat too, if you guys are already like nerding out on money, if this is kind of your first step towards doing that, give yourself a pat on the back if so, but we're really excited to be part of that journey with you guys. We're going to give you some really great recommendations at the end too, but just start getting comfortable with it. Pick up a book about money, find a podcast that talks about it, even if it's indirectly talking about it explore YouTube channels. Like there's obviously ours, but some other great ones as well. And just start having those conversations. You know, friends don't talk about money unless one friend starts the conversation. So don't be afraid to be that friend that opens those conversations and starts talking about it. So as I mentioned, we have a little bit of a different approach of what we consider financial literacy. And to us, that's really about understanding where you're at and using that to just start getting familiar with money deciding where you want to go because, you know, we love goals and I think it's really important to really dive into what it means to you and what you want out of this life and then finding the path to get there. So our goal is to really help you guys connect those three dots so that you can continue learning from here. First and foremost, you have to know where you're at. So this is what kind of what we call financial health. It's kind of like starting a new diet or wanting to lose weight. You have to figure out like your goals and like where you currently stand, right? Like what are you currently eating? What do you currently weigh maybe, right? What are your um, workouts like? Um, but for finance, that's looking at your income, your savings, your debt, credit score, expenses, and a few other things. So that's what we're going to get started with. And the first element, most importantly, is probably your income. So do you actually know how much you're making each month? Sure, you get a paycheck of, let's say, I don't know, 1860 every two weeks, but are you looking at that in like your monthly income and then your like yearly income? I think those are really important numbers to know. And there's also a big difference between gross and net income. So what that means is if you get hired for a job and your gross income is 60,000, that doesn't mean you're going to take home 60,000 that year. You're actually going to be taxed on that. Um, and you're going to take home maybe closer to like 45,000, but it's just knowing that, um, is really important. So write down your monthly income. Yeah. And like, I always, my cheat sheet to remember that. Cause I find those terms super generic and hard. Like I literally just think gross, like icky <laughs> because it's the number that you see and you think you get that. And then you're like, Oh wait, tax gets taken out of that. So it's the gross number. And then the net income, you can also think of it's kind of like the money you're catching. Like if it was falling in a net, the government's stealing that little tax money off the top and then the rest falls into your hands. Do you want to speak to the multiple jobs quick actually? Yeah. So an interesting point too, especially as students, um, when you're working more than one jobs, your jobs aren't talking to each other. So they, they don't know you're working another job. So they're going to tax you at the rate that they're paying you. So if it's a part-time job, they're probably going to only withhold a, like the lowest amount. So come tax time, you're going to realize that you're going to owe more in taxes because your total income is more than what your job thought you were making. So that's why sometimes when people file their taxes after working multiple jobs, they're confused why they owe money to the government. Yeah. So once you've written down your monthly income, obviously if you guys don't, don't know this offhand too, just make a note that you want to get this information later, but that's the first thing you're going to do. You're going to write that down and then you're going to move to your expenses. So we like to look at these kind of in three categories of what are your fixed monthly expenses. So those are the things that you can't change if you want to. Obviously I have Netflix in there as an example, you could get rid of your Netflix, but really think of those things where you're like, realistically, I want to watch my Netflix shows. So that's in my life as a set monthly bill. It means every month that's going to show up on your bill at $14.99 or whatever it is. Your phone bill is going to be showing up. Those are the really predictable costs that you have. The second ones are how much are you spending outside of that? So that's the things you're talking about in the chat often, the restaurants, the clothing, the online shopping, right? Um, figuring out what that number is. 
And then lastly, if you do have any debt that you're paying off, whether that's student loans, a line of credit, maybe credit card, um, a personal loan, figuring out what that monthly amount is. So you really want to take that monthly number of your income that's coming in and then the monthly number of how much you're putting out. So a good way to do this, if you're not really familiar right now, I always like to start with the fixed expenses because that's a lot easier. You can look at a statement even and say, okay, what are the bills I have each month? Figure out that fixed number. And then for the variable, what you can do is take your last three months. Um, this is like a more manual process or I mean, some people use apps, but I just pull up my last three statements and kind of highlight and categorize to get me a general idea of like, oh, this is how much I actually spend on food and Uber Eats. This is how much was on clothing. And then you can get that average. The next element will be debt. So the most important things to keep in mind when taking on debt is the principal amount. So this is the amount that you're actually borrowing. There's the interest, which is the amount that the lender is charging you to borrow that money in your term. So how long are you borrowing this money for and how long you have to pay it back? Um, and then most importantly, what is your minimum payments? Because you don't want to miss that and screw up your credit score. And your minimum payment will be a combination of your principal and your interest. So if you have any outstanding debts, write that down. Again, it could be student loans, credit cards, or car loans. And yeah, again, most common ones. Um, there are I just student debt versus other debt. Yeah, so there's, um, you might have heard of things called like good debt and bad debt. Um, the good debt is debt that um, will appreciate in value and then bad debt is things that will lower in value as time goes on. Um, but student debt is one of those debts that it's a debt, but you don't have to necessarily pay it all off to be in a good financial position. And the reason for this is because the interest rates are currently so low that if you were to invest that money instead or pay off some other higher debts, um, you'll still be in a good financial position. And then next thing is your credit score. So this is pretty much um, a report card that your lender is going to get. So they know how well you're borrowing and repaying that money. Are you paying it right away? Are you taking a couple months to pay it back? Um, that all comes down to your credit score. The lower your score, the worse your reputation is in terms of borrowing money and the higher it is, the better it is. Um, a good baseline would be 680. And this is mainly for like pur purchasing a home. So if your credit score is under this amount, it's, you're gonna have a hard time getting a loan from a traditional bank. Um, but that's not to say you can't get that back up to that mark after a couple months. Um, and if you don't know what your current credit score is, you can go through your online bank. Normally they have a portal where you can just click um, online uh, credit score check, um, or you can check out Borrowell. It's um, a third party that can run your numbers for you and pop up a credit score. Super uh, interesting stuff. I honestly look at mine every month. I'm just trying to work on it and just making it better each and every month. Yeah, and stuff like the Borwell or the bank one, they're considered like a soft credit check. So it doesn't affect your credit to do that check. Some people are really nervous because they've heard of that, which is more like a hard credit check if you're applying to buy a house or something. So having these platforms, it, it's not always like 100%, but it's close enough and it just lets you know like where you're sitting. <coughs> Excuse me. And the last as aspect of your financial health is really your perspective on money. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that we have different cultural or even family contexts. You could have grown up in a family that has different types of money issues. So that is going to come into play. So that might mean that you have some limiting beliefs around money. Um, it means that Josh and I can be sitting here living similar lives and still have a different perspective on money. So it's really important to kind of get familiar with that. And also there's other additional barriers or challenges. Some people are supporting their entire family financially, right? So really kind of just getting to know how you feel about money um, and kind of what those triggers can be for you or what those hesitations can be. You know, we have people that hoard their savings. We have people that like go out and spend everything and kind of asking where do I fall in that and what might the reason be? So 
what we want you to do here is really reflect on money and see what comes up for you. And I know that's a pretty broad statement. So we're actually going to give you a few minutes with a little exercise to help give you a starting point. So you'll see a bunch of sentences on here. Some are similar to each other. Um, you can kind of approach this as two ways, either, you know, making a little note of ones that immediately almost you feel something reading it. You're like, oh, that feels gross or that feels accurate or rating them of like on a scale of one to 10, how do these feel? So I think this is a really great starting point for people. And you can actually look up more limiting beliefs around money or other categories to do this exercise. And sometimes you might realize like, oh, I didn't really, you know, think about some, like you might not say out loud, I'm destined to be poor, but maybe reading that you go, oh, I actually do kind of feel that, or there's some sort of layer there. So Marking down those ones is a really great starting point. So we'll just leave this up. If you guys want a screenshot too, you can do that. But just take a second and look to see if any of these um, really resonate for you. I definitely, definitely feel like after reading some of these, I it resonated with me early on. And then as I got more financially literate um, and figured out the root of why I thought that way, my perspectives are now changed. Mm -hmm. so it's interesting to see. And some of them can be, it doesn't mean that it's all, we're not saying all these things are false, right? We're talking about, um, like as an example, if I earn more than my siblings, it will put a strain on our relationship. We're not gonna try to tell you that's not true. That might be really true for your situation, but recognizing that that resonates and go, oh, am I actually kind of like, you know, staying more quiet about my money or holding myself back because I'm worried about that. It lets you kind of address it both internally, maybe have those conversations with your siblings and really just get to the root of those things. All right. So we're going to keep it moving. We will, we can share these with you guys if you want to come back to them. So now that you've figured out where you stand, you know, your income, you know, your expenses and your debts. Once you have all that info, you have to decide now where you want to go. And we kind of looked at this as four different stages or four examples of where you could go in terms of um, your financial journey. Um, the first one is going to be trying to get out of debt. So this is where your focus is trying to pay off all your debt as soon as you can. Um, and pretty much like you're not investing and you're just focusedly, uh, he heavily focused on paying off those debts to get that zero base. And the, the next step would be to set a foundation. So once all of your debt um, is paid off, you can start now saving for an emergency fund, which is about three to six months of living expenses in a savings account, just in case something happens like an unexpected uh, car repair or you lose your job, right? It gives you a buffer to um, stay financially afloat um, while navigating life's unexpected situations. Um, and this is also when you can start looking at a TFSA and RRSP, right? Um, and so once you set your foundation, now you can upgrade your lifestyle. You have no debts, you have an emergency fund, you can start planning for your retirement, um, maybe even starting to save for a down payment. Um, this is where you're more comfortable with investments. Maybe you have some automated investments at this point. And at the same time, you should thank yourself or congratulate yourself for making it this far and maybe upping that coffee or food budget that you have just to um, live the lifestyle that you want, right? You don't have to um, not buy that coffee just to be financially free as long as you, you know where your money is going in and out of. And finally, the ultimate goal is financial independence. That could look like retiring early uh, and this could be through living off some passive income sources that you have been able to create um, but honestly, for us, it's just about the freedom to work on what you want to work and having that time back. So those are kind of the fate of four, four main um, stages that we see. So this is our process for deciding where you want to go. We keep it really simple. So you're going to set goals, you're actually going to care about them, and then you're going to set systems to make it happen. So let's start with that goal. So what I want you guys to do is write down a short term and a long-term financial goal. And by financial goal, it means anything that has financial implications. So you could have a goal of 
traveling to Asia next year, right? It's not saying I want to save X, but you need money to take that trip. So that's what I want you to think of is goals that have those financial implications. So think about what you want. Is it a house? Is it an annual vacation, right? Maybe you want the ability to not just take a vacation this year, but to set yourself up to take one every year. Maybe you want to retire your parents early. Pick something that actually gets you excited. And we're going to dive into that. But that is a really important piece. We can have those non-sexy goals of paying off debt, but we want to find ways that we can really care about it because that is honestly the best way to reach those goals and to stop sabotaging yourself along the way and then giving yourself um, some harsh inner critic words when you are sabotaging. So the first question is when you go to write down those goals is thinking about are those goals and aspirations actually yours? So I'll give you an example. We might hear our favorite YouTuber say they are working towards financial freedom. But what does that really mean, right? And if that's your goal, really breaking down what does that even mean for you? So in this first example, person one, maybe when they say financial freedom, they're actually just talking about making 75,000 a year, really comfortably covering their bills, being able to spend without micromanaging, you know, on a Friday night deciding, let's go for dinner, we can do that, no big deal, right? Whereas person two over here might be talking about financial freedom, and they might already have a million dollars invested, and they still don't feel like they're financially free, right? They might literally be chasing 50 million. So this is really important in how you're consuming, um, so that if you're, you know, following someone who wants financial freedom and you're trying to get the 75,000 a year and they're giving you a plan for this like 50 million hustle hard that you don't want to sign up for or the opposite, it's really important to recognize like, what do we actually mean by financial freedom? Another example could be person A says they want to be financially free. And that means the luxury travel we see on Instagram, right? It maybe means supporting an extended family. Whereas person B might want to be financially free, but they're looking to live off 20 grand a year and live in the woods with a little mortgage-free small cabin, right? Maybe all by themselves, no dependents. Those are really different situations. And just important in when you're hearing other people's stories, if someone's, you know, explaining how they're financially free and you're feeling the burden of maybe, you know, bringing your family over from the Philippines, those are very different contexts, right? So looking at other people's situation that way, but also asking yourself, what do I even mean? I joke with Josh all the time. He always wants to be financially free. I'm like, but what does it mean? Right? So really breaking that down. So what you can do is kind of like take off that defensive shield with yourself later and keep asking yourself, but what do I mean by that? What do I really want until you land on the final answer? It's kind of like when toddlers just keep asking us why and you explain and then they ask why and why and why. That's what you're going to do to yourself. So take that, whether it's the short term or the long term goal or that feeling you want to have and ask yourself, what does that really mean? So we're going to go through a little example here. So we're, we'll say this is Josh. OK, so Josh says he wants to be financially free. And so when he says, well, what do I really mean by that? I actually just don't want to feel stressed about money. I never want to feel stressed about money. Great. But what's going to make us not feel stressed about money? Then he might say, well, I think having enough saved and invested. You know, I just want to have enough saved and invested that I don't have to stress about it. Okay. So then we want to ask, well, what does that really mean? How much is that? And these numbers also are just like real. I just put some twos and zeros together. So don't like think that you're going to go live off this. Um, but he might say, well, you know what, if I have, you know, 20,000 in an emergency fund saved and maybe 200K invested, I think that I'm going to feel pretty good. I'm going to feel like I have enough, right? And then we might say, okay, well, when do you need to feel that though? Is that when you're 60 or is that when you're 29, right? So you might go, okay, well, I think six years from now. So we've gone from saying we want financial freedom to we want 20,000 in savings and 200,000 invested in six years. So see how it can really make it more tangible. And then there's also that element of what is the feeling? So yes, we love a tangible element. The tangible can change though. You might decide that deep down what you do want is a sense of security no matter what happens. So two years from now, Josh might decide those numbers have to be a lot higher or maybe they could even be lower. So really breaking down what is it that you're looking for when you set those goals. So once you've kind of given yourself that toddler exercise, 
the next part is going to take a while. You have to actually test if you care about those goals. So seeing if those goals get you excited. Are you checking the savings account where you're saving for that thing? Are you like, you know, celebrating every time you pay off a little debt? So give yourself kind of two to three months to just start incorporating that into your life. If it's the vacation that you want to take, look at yourself in two months and say, have I put any money towards that vacation? If the answer is no, unless there's been like crazy circumstances, you can kind of look at, am I just, you know, planning for a vacation because it sounded nice when Mal said it? Maybe I don't feel a vacation's realistic with the current like circumstance of the world. So then you can go, you know what? I need to find a different angle that's going to make saving fun because whether it's saving or investing, you have to be excited about it and find ways to gamify it for yourself. Ooh, so now <laughs> that we figured out what our financial um, health is and we know what we want, that financial freedom that you're striving towards that fits your life, um, now let's figure out what path do we need to get there. And for any path that you choose, one of the most important things is to increase your income. So different ways you can do this is to get a raise at your current job or get a promotion, or honestly, switch employees. I think of a job kind of like rent. Like once you get a salary, sometimes it's hard to get those like incremental increases. And after a few years, when you switch jobs, you're with that new job, they're gonna pay you at like the current market value of what your skill sets are, right? So that's something that not many people think about, but definitely something worthwhile. Um, you could also, take home more work. So look to up your hours or even land a part-time job to experiment with or experiment with some freelance work. Um, and lastly, our, our most, um, our favorite one is to start a side hustle. So build something of your own, use it as a direct financial goal to set you up. Sometimes you could have a side hustle that pay like anything you make from it pays off your cell phone bills, right? It could be as simple as that to help you get more income and save more in your expenses. So we wanted to just touch on briefly, you know, a lot of people talk about passive income. So to give you guys some high levels of outside of that, you know, working a job or building a business, how can you up that income, that money that's coming in? And the first way of doing this is real estate investing. And we won't go heavy into this because this is going to be like a, a tier two later down the road thing for you. But whether you want to buy a home for yourself, for a family member or to rent, these are going to be the four most important components. So if that is on your game plan, if that's somewhere that you want to go, these are the elements that matter to you most. So your income, how much money you make. As a rough guide, you can multiply your income by five to understand what you would be approved for a mortgage. So that's a really nice way. If you don't want to open up a conversation with a mortgage broker yet, that's a quick way to figure out where you're sitting. For your debt, that's going to be the second one. So debt is kind of interesting because it's not so much about ha having like a big total amount. It's more about the monthly payments. So you could owe, let's say 200,000. I don't know why you borrowed that from someone, but let's say you owe 200,000, but your monthly payment is like 50 bucks a month versus you have a car payment that's maybe 5,000 total, but the monthly payments are $500 a month. When it comes to real estate, that's going to hurt you a little bit more. So really looking at that, the monthly payment which as a side, like a lot of people you might hear, don't buy a car right before you, before you buy a home. That's part of it because you're going to have that monthly debt going into it. Um, I'm seeing some great questions, by the way. We're definitely going to get into auto real estate. <laughs> um, Josh is a realtor too. I don't know if we mentioned that. So this is very much his zone of genius. Um, the next one is your credit score. So as Josh mentioned earlier, you do need a minimum of 680 for most um, mortgage approvals. That's almost the only hard point in real estate where if you're under that, it's a no unless you go to altern alternative investing options. So like if you check your credit score and you're like, oh, not great, um, that's something you could really focus on. And a solid goal for anyone overall is an 800 credit score. That's like big like three shares let's have a little party for you and lastly is the down payment so that's the money that you're saving that most people are talking about so how much money do you have saved whatever you get approved for, for a mortgage the down payment is really that difference so if you want to buy a five hundred fifty thousand dollar home and you get approved for a 500 mortgage 
you have to come up with that other 50 grand. And so a lot of people want to save a lot, but your income is actually the most important thing for this um, approach. And another way of creating passive additional income is through investing in the stock market. I'm sure with COVID and the way the world is now, lots of people are talking about stocks and, and crypto and all that stuff, right? Um, but these are three avenues you can take to get your foot in the door in, into the stock market. The first option would be to go solo. This is pretty much you stock picking and doing everything on your own. Again, it's the most time consuming because you actually have to review charts, um, go in, buy, sell, and just like pretty much always be on your phone and looking at your investments. Um, and it requires a little bit more knowledge, again, unless you're just like picking and gambling essentially, right? Um, which is why it's the biggest risk. A second option would be a robo advisor. So this is a financial advisor that is based off an algorithm. Um, so it requires a little bit of your time to kind of figure out which robo advisor you want to go with and what their styles are, but pretty much set it and, and let it go. And it could be tailored to your goals and comfort levels. They ask when you need this money. Do you need this for a down payment five years from now? Or do you need this when you're 65 and retired, right? And is your comfort level, like, is your, are you low risk or are you high risk, right? So these are things that you could tailor for your robo, robo advisor um, so that they can um, invest for you. And then the third option is to hire out for a financial planner or an, inve an investment broker. Um, it takes the least amount of time because you pretty much set up a consultation with them and they take all your information and, and then they would then invest the money for you. Um, but proceed with caution. There's a lot of finance people out there. So just make sure you're um, choosing the right one and you think it's the right option for you. Yeah, because this one tends to be when people want to be the most removed. So that's where you really want to make sure that it's somebody that you trust um, with your money, because if you're just gonna be like, you manage it, I'm gonna go chill over here and like come back to you in a few years and see where we're at. Uh, you really, and also I wouldn't wait a few years to check in with them. <laughs> but that one usually is for people that wanna be more removed. So it really does mean you have to have a lot more trust there. And we're gonna uh, quickly touch on TFSA and RSP. I'm sure you've heard about this all the time, but lots of people get confused about them. A TFSA stands for tax-free savings account. And essentially what it is, it's taking your after tax or taxed income um, into an account where you're able to invest that money. So you can invest this money into stocks and bonds. And as your money grows, once you take it out, so any profits that you've gained, you don't have to pay any taxes on and it's pretty much just your money, right? Whereas an RSP stands for a registered retirement savings plan, but it takes income that's not yet taxed. So if you put money into it, it can grow and you can invest in the stock market and bonds, just like a TFSA. But at the end, when you take out your profits, you're actually taxed on that money. So both very similar accounts, they do, they, they're both useful, but at different points in your financial um, stage. Um, and as a younger person, especially like a student starting off, um, lots of people start off with their TFSA um, before going to the RSP side. Yeah, the one thing with this is there's no like solid answer. I feel like every young person is like, do I put it in TFSA? Do I put it in RSP? It is very hard. And it's a bit of just figuring out on your own. And I wouldn't say you, you're going to mess it up that bad. You know, if you want to like start by starting in one, at least just to start, then you're going to be doing okay. So the other thing, that, so that's really looking at income options. So if you decide, okay, I really wanna buy a house or go on that vacation, you can up your income with those avenues. The second one is reducing your expenses. So it's kind of like a business when we look at the cash flow, you can either increase the revenue you're making or you can reduce the expenses. So here's just a few examples because I think sometimes people just think about, you know, like calling their phone provider and negotiating, but there's a few ways you can reduce your expenses. First is cutting expenses entirely. So if there are any fixed or variable expenses you can remove, this doesn't mean you have to live super lean, but you might realize in doing that earlier exercise of checking your statements like, okay, wow, I really am doing a lot of the copy. It doesn't mean you don't have to cut it out, but maybe you're only doing it on weekends or you pick a few days of the week where you really want to go get that coffee. Um, so you can actually take some of these out. 
You can also reduce your fees. So this is where you can negotiate your bills down. Sometimes it's nice to just check in with internet providers, cell phones, things like that, because they might be willing to give you a new promo that's running. Um, and you can also give yourself a reduced budget. So that's kind of more on the variable spending, which we'll talk a little bit more after this. And lastly, this one's not gonna be like anything crazy, but you can't split your costs. Like sometimes it's as simple as your sister and her boyfriend use your Netflix and you know they don't mind chipping in. So if they just wanna pay you the 50 bucks a year or whatever it might be, it is nice. Or if you find with your partner, if you're always buying gas and you find that the gas has like really gotten more expensive, you can split those costs with somebody that's in your life. And it also, again, just opens up those money conversations. You're not saying, hey, I can't afford to pay Netflix for all of us, but you can just say, hey, do you want to chip in on my Netflix that you're stealing? <laughs> um, and then we talked a little bit about reducing those expenses in terms of giving yourself like a tighter budget. Um, this is the spending system we use. And I've taught it to a lot of my even like business coaching clients because it's just simple. We love simple. And that's the biggest takeaway for this. Whether you do it the same way as us or not, it needs to be simple enough that you're following it. So it's a great idea to say, I'm going to put everything in a spreadsheet and I'm going to categorize how much I'm spending in each category each month, but you're probably not doing it. And if you are doing it, there's not necessarily great takeaways from it. So what we do is we each give ourselves a monthly personal allowance, just like we're five again. And that is just like one budget for all that variable spending. So we take our income and then we take out those fixed expenses. And that's going to be really easy for you because you're going to have figured out that number. So let's say it's costing you $1,900 to live every month. You would take that out of your income and then maybe take out whatever those savings goals are, whether it's debt repayment, whether you're putting an emergency fund aside and then decide how much money you wanna give yourself. Good starting point could be $200, 250. See if you can stick to that. And that's gonna be the clothes, the coffee shops, the restaurants. Um, I, I count groceries as a fixed expense because I just like give it a ballpark. So I wouldn't put your groceries in there, but we even did like, you know, when you do those grocery store trips where you're just buying some snacks on a Friday night, like that goes into your personal allowance. And we load it onto a Coho card personally it kind of works as a like a preloaded visa. So I really like it because each month I could put that 250 on and then that's just the spending money. You could also use the system with just your debit account, depending how your bank's set up. Um, and with something like Coho, it is nice because you get notifications for monthly spending. So I can go buy that coffee and then I get a notification that says you spent $5, you now have $245 left. So easy. And then it doesn't matter if I want to spend $200 on clothes and only $50 on a nice dinner, or if I want to spend it all on dinners, it gives you that little bit of flexibility because honestly, it doesn't matter that much how much it is going towards my coffees versus my clothes. Personally, no, I just want to know that I'm staying in that realm. And Coho is pretty much foolproof because it's a prepaid credit card and you can only use what you have on it. So it doesn't actually put you into debt. So if you have a budget of 200 bucks and you're onto your last dollar, you can't buy that $4 coffee with your coho because yeah, it won't work. <laughs> it won't work. So it's kind of like protecting you as well and being like, you're over budget, you spent it all, <laughs> wait till next month, right? So yeah, and someone just asked, there's no charge. Um, so if you use, I put my code in there, it, I think it gets you $20 cash back if you purchase something in the first like 30 days or something. But um, yeah, there's no fee to use it and there's no fee to get the card. So you just sign up and they mail you a card. You also instantly get like an online version. Um, again, like I have a code, but we're super non-biased in this. It's just the thing that we love and so many people use. I love the notifications too, because it really keeps me in the loop because if I'm like going a little shop crazy early in the month, those notifications, you get to very visibly see right away. Like, Ooh, I only have like a hundred dollars left and it's, November 9th, right? So it can help you kind of pace yourself. And obviously we have forgiveness. If you need to adjust, you can do that, but it will really help you figure out how much you're actually spending every month. And it's super easy to apply for, and it doesn't even affect your credit score because it's not a full on credit card, right? You just, yeah. So it's again, very powerful tool. And looking at option three, we're going to look at prioritizing your debt. So this is an interesting one. A lot of people think they should pay off the debt that has the highest amount owing first. But in reality, a good rule of thumb is to try and pay off the debt that has the highest interest rate. 
right? So in, in, our, in this example here, you would pay off your $50,000 loan at 5% before your $200,000 loan at 2%. The reason for this is that the interest rate, the higher interest rates will compound and put you in a hole way faster than the lower interest rates debt, right? So that's kind of um, how we would prioritize our debts. And once you start paying off um, one debt, you kind of create this debt repayment snowball that you feel confident and then you can keep um, paying those off. And then option four is to improve your credit. Um, realistically, you're gonna need your credit for something even as simple as a cell phone, right? So ways you can improve your credit score would be to make sure your utilization is under 30%. Um, kind of what this means is that when you use your credit card, if you have a thousand dollar limit, 30% of that is 300 bucks. And if you're spending like $500 on that card every month, your rate is at 50%, which makes you more at risk because the lenders are afraid that you're gonna overextend yourself and borrow too much money that you can handle. So if you can keep it under 30%, you're pretty much good. Um, and also I skipped that first part. Um, <laughs> it's to use your credit card and pay it off on time. I use credit cards for everything, all of my spending, but at the end of the month, I always make sure to pay in full. And also like, I know how much money I have in savings and I don't spend more money than I actually have. Yeah, I think like with that, a lot of people when, you know, they have a bad credit score or bad experience, they go, I don't use credit anymore. And sometimes we need that boundary, but also recognizing that a good way to improve your credit score is to show like, hey, I can use this credit properly. Another way you can help improve your credit is to pay off your debts. Um, just make sure you pay that minimum monthly payment, but try and pay it off more so you can pay it off um, sooner. And especially don't miss a minimum payment because once you do, it's automatically going to hit your credit score because you had a missed payment. It's like missing your rent. And lastly, if you are in a lot of um, trouble with your credit, I think it's best to work with a professional um, that can give you step-by-step -step, um, resources and a path so that you can get your credit score up to a healthy amount. So those are kind of your options for whatever path that you choose that makes sense for you. But if you're like, okay, but I don't really know what my goals are, right? Or I need some time to figure it out. Here's just kind of that baseline foundation. So the first thing you can focus on is building that emergency fund. So Josh mentioned it earlier briefly, but aim for about three to six months of living expenses. And you wanna keep this in a high interest savings account, which just means if you ever have a chunk of money sitting, um, for that rainy day, you want to make sure it's in an account where it's earning money. And the next one would be set an exciting savings goal. So once you have that emergency fund, and these can be gradual, right? You could have two months of your emergency fund and then start working on that exciting savings goal. It could be a vacation, a house, maybe investing a certain amount in the market that you want to. Um, and then creating that personal spending system. So whether it's with the Coho card, or your own process, figuring out how much you're going to put into all these categories. And then lastly is really deciding where you want to go and what you need to get there. So what is it that you have as the short-term and long-term financial goals? And do you need to increase your in income, reduce your expenses, invest, whatever it might be. And most importantly, the easiest way to get better with money is to actually enjoy getting better with money. So if anything we said really spoke to you, focus on those areas and learn about those areas because that's going to be the best way for you to enjoy it. And we're good to start taking questions. I can leave this up for a minute too, but these are just, I mentioned we would drop you guys some resources. These are just some starting point ones that we love. Um, I also included my personal website has a favorite resource link for a lot of these tools or the books and stuff like that. Um, if you want to reference, but these are some different people in the money space you can check out. Questions? <laughs> awesome, folks. So I just wanted to mention that we will be sending everybody who's attending the, this event today the slides that Josh and Mallory have created here. So don't worry about that. We will send them to you folks. Um, so guys, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat or you can raise your hand to ask them aloud. Um, I do know there was one or two and I think that, Yeah, I, we have a couple back in the chat here. So let me just scroll back here, guys, and see what we've got. 
Okay, so let's see. So there's one in the Q and A mm -hmm. um, about credit scores. So why does checking your credit score lower it? No. Uh, yeah, you can try. <laughs> so like, yeah, there's the soft check and the hard check. So if you check it through your bank or through something like Borrowell, it will not lower your credit. It's kind of like, uh, picture it like you're just like taking a little peek at it. It doesn't affect it. You're just like checking in on it. Whereas these hard credit checks, um, it feel like personally, it's kind of outdated that it affects your credit, but it is like when you're going to purchase a car, for example, if you're going to sign up for a new credit card, whenever you're taking an opportunity to see if you can qualify for more credit, that credit card, that credit check is considered a hard hit and you're, I don't know, like. Yeah, your credit score goes down because I think um, they're questioning why you're looking to check your score, do a hard check so often, so frequently, right? So if you, in one month, signed up for three credit cards and got a car loan, the banks are gonna be like, why are they like, look, like looking to take on all this debt, right? Versus if you were to do that in the span of a year, it wouldn't affect you pretty much at all. I know like people realize that you do credit checks, um, like hard ones, so it's okay to do like one or two, but once you start like, constantly doing them frequently that's when the hard checks will affect your score yeah and if you do have multiple just be conscious in spreading it out i had a really great company reach out about a credit card they were offering but we had just applied for a mortgage for our new house so i was like you know what this sounds great but honestly like i don't really need a card right now and i'm not interested in like doing that hard credit check or touching my my credit it's it's a very old school general or concept in general but it really is just that tangible report card because otherwise there's no way for them to see your track record. And that's really what it's trying to represent is like, am I good for the money? Do I pay the money back with the terms? There's another question there. It's like, they don't always declare it. So, but you can always ask, be like, hey, is this a soft or hard check? Is it gonna affect my they score? Should. They should be, um, but things like when you open a new credit card, they're pretty much always gonna do a hard check. When you're getting a car loan, they'll do like a hard check, right? So when you're like, actively doing that but if you're just like looking online um typically it's a soft check yeah but and definitely i would make sure i would believe that credit karma is a soft check yeah it's, 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 it's like borrow well um there was another question that you could speak to the ottawa real estate market right now any thoughts on the Ottawa real estate it's becoming quite high um my thoughts on the market is that I think you have to look at real estate um, specifically to where your location is. Um, a city like Ottawa, where we have three major post-secondary schools, creating professionals, have lots of government workers, good startups, tourism, right? It's the COVID kind of proved that we have a bulletproof economy here and that a lot like real estate in Ottawa is always going to be um, in demand versus other cities that are more dependent on certain industries like oil and gas. So if oil and gas is doing really well, people start losing their jobs, and then now nobody's living in that area, that's when those prices go down. What I tell some of my clients is you always have to look at what your goals are, right? So if you're looking to get into real estate as an investment and you can't afford it right now, maybe look at other investment opportunities, or maybe you have to be a little bit more um, savvy with the way you look at real estate. So I have a client who wants to still live in the city, but wants to get in real estate, um, but her budget doesn't let her afford in the city. So what she is now looking to do is find a place outside of the city within her budget. And then when she finds that place, she's gonna rent it out and have a tenant there and she'll keep her rent in the city. So she can still live in the city, but she's technically in real estate, right? So it's just finding different ways like that to get in the market without always having your traditional route of buying that home to live in. And I mentioned earlier, some people are really hesitant to meet with a mortgage broker, but personally, just like sitting down with a mortgage broker, that is a really great starting point. Even if you know you're not at a point, like if you don't have money saved at all, but you want to sit down and say, okay, this is what I'm making. This is the debt that I'm paying off. I'm hoping to have X saved. They can give you some perspective and they can let you know too, the best areas to improve. So 
what a lot of people do is they're like working on saving that down payment and all they're focused on is saving. But if they met with the mortgage broker earlier, he could say, hey, if you really work on getting a small raise in the next six months, that would like shoot up past any of the savings you're doing. So I think like, again, don't be afraid to have those conversations, whether you have a friend that's in it, or if you just, Josh has a really great mortgage broker in Ottawa that he can connect you with. They're not like sharks the way that I think some people are a little bit intimidated by it. And there's a follow-up. Our condo is a good real estate investment as a first home. Um, definitely. I mean, condos, it's going to come down to lifestyle. So if you want to be like walking distance to a coffee shop and stuff, uh, I think condos are a great entry point. In terms of a, a, as a strict investment property, you have to look at your rental rates and see if it's, again, in a good location that you could rent it out. Um, the thing about condos that we learned about with COVID in the work from home era is that you want at least a one plus den or a two bed condo. Uh, one, one bed condos now are struggling a little bit because if you have either one person or two people working from home, you want a designated office spot that's not your bedroom, right? So we're seeing the one plus den and two bed condos being more in demand versus your one bed condo. So um, yeah, it comes down to location, lifestyle, and, and what you're looking out of it. And condos, of course, have condo fees. So con if you're purchasing a condo, you have a lower purchase power than if you're purchasing something without condo fees, right? Yeah. Because the mortgage has to factor in those condo fees. So as a rough example, like you could be approved for like a 520 condo and then a 550 freehold. So it's just something to think about. Um, another question too, I, you kind of touched on this, but um, being unsure of where, whether they're living in Canada long-term. So wondering about investing because they have the money for a down payment and the salary what was the question? so like um they don't know if they want to live long if they're going to be living long term in canada so that's still worth it to invest i think honestly like it's just about if you do want to have that property one thing i've learned with us getting into real estate is growing up real estate felt so big and scary and permanent and i was like i remember growing up i was determined that i would only buy a house like with cash <laughs> whether that was realistic or not. Cause I was like, it seems so crazy to buy something that's like literally like four and no, more than four times, like 10 times what you maybe have in the bank. Right. But the more you can learn about real estate, the less scary it can become. And you see some people buy something and they sell it in two years or, you know, they buy it for themselves and they decide that it's a rental and then they move on. I think we kind of, a lot of us grew up in this, like the home we grew up in is maybe the main home our parents had. So it feels that big and permanent and scary. Um, and I think you have to like look at it as an investment in general. So if you believe in real estate and the real estate market, maybe go that route. But if you believe more in the stock market and the way like, like major companies are operating, go that route. Um, definitely um, look into um like your options. So when people think real estate, it's good to have options. So if you were to buy now, even though you might move in, in a few years, at least once that comes, you can either sell the place, you can either rent it, or you can either refinance it, which means pulling some equity from that home as down payment for another place, right? So I always tell that to clients, it's about options. It's not always about beating the market because in five years, the market could go down a bit, right? And again, you don't have to sell. You could always rent it to cover your, your expenses or pull from the equity that you were able to build so that you have more money to, for that next, next home. Right. So, um, I have clients right now that are doing that. They're, they just bought their first home in Ottawa, planning to be here for five years and then move back to Vancouver. And they plan on, on, on exactly that renting it, selling it or refinancing it for their next down payment. Mm -hmm. There's a question as well about um, student loans and obviously there's OSAP for Ontario. There is a, website i have it on that favorite resource page on my website that i mentioned they're called juno and they use like group buying power for student loans so that could be something you can look in as well so essentially they get better loans and rates because they're pulling together like a bunch of different students and it is a global organization so you could check them out too and what is a freehold a freehold right. is just a, a home that has no condo fees essentially right so your standard single family home or your town home um, and then if you have condo fees every month that pay for your common fees, your, your roof repairs and windows and all that, that would be a condo. 
Okay, so Matt and Josh, I've got a quick question before we wrap up here. So I've got one credit card and I'm wondering, like, you know, I'm not going to say my exact age, but like in my mid to late 20s, like, should I have more than one credit card? Like, is that fair for my credit score to have more than one? Like if I'm paying it off regularly or is it okay for me to proceed with um, just one credit card? Mm, I love um, like incremental credit hopping, we'll call it, but um, whether, okay, so one option would be almost every six months you can apply for like um, an increase on that card. So you could get that one card up pretty high. Like that's one route that would be great. Um, basically the more credit you have, the better, because if, if you don't have a problem with like overusing it, right. So I'm going to give that definitely like asterisks. If you feel confident that getting like a bunch of credit cards, isn't going to make you go spend like crazy. Um, but you can continue to up the credit capacity on that card because then your ratio is always going to be smaller, right? Like you're maybe using 20% instead of 30% of the credit that you have available. Um, you definitely can get additional credit cards, but always just be mindful of like the fees, if it's worth it, if it's really overcomplicating your systems. Um, one thing that I actually found through my own experience that was kind of cool is like, if you do accumulate more cards under one bank, they can often like convert them to a line of credit. So I had opened a line of credit and I had two credit cards and I wasn't really using one of them an anymore. And instead of just closing it, they were able to like allocate that credit to my line of credit, which upped that. So definitely you could keep one and try to up it on a cons consistent basis. I would really recommend that. Like I've been doing that since high school because my mom always was big on it. Josh hadn't. And even just in terms of big purchases or like that credit ability, we've really seen a reflection. Like I get approved so easy for additional credit or credit cards with our business because I have so much more credit under my name. And Josh had like a credit card with, I don't know, like a thousand dollar max for a really long time because it worked for him, but he wasn't accumulating that um, credit. And I think it comes down to like hacking in a way. Like I have three credit cards. I have one for my personal bills. So like cell phone and like my utility bills and stuff. I have the coho card that's just for like my, my fun money, my no regret spending money because they have that limit, right? So it stops me from overspending. Right. Make sure your credit cards have your jobs. That's pretty much what I'm getting to, right? And I have a third credit card that's just for my business expenses. So anything related to my business goes onto that card. So it keeps it all organized, but each yeah. card has its own job. And one card I could add that I'm debating on adding is a cashback card, right? So yeah, make yeah. sure your, your credit cards are, are, have a job. Coho isn't a credit card, it's just to be clear. Like there's no credit check when you get a Coho card. It, it works more like a debit because it's a prepaid visa. It's kind of like if somebody bought you a prepaid visa at the store. Um, a sep you don't have, so the question was, do you have separate credit scores for each new credit card? No, you have like one credit score as a human. Um, so those credit, different credit cards are going to factor into it. So it's really important. Um, like if you're in a store and they try to sign you up for your cards, like anything like that, um, Obviously, sometimes they're a good opportunity, but in general, you probably don't want those ones because they can tend to overcomplicate it, or maybe there's a fee every year and you're not even, you stop using that card, you kind of forget about it. Um, so it's one credit score for all of it. Picture your credit score as like your GPA and, and everything that comes into it. It's just all your little courses, right? Your car loans, your, your five, your three credit cards, like that's all a different course, but your overall credit score is just your overall GPA on how you're doing and everything. Um, and somebody asked for Coho, are you losing points that maybe like a visa passport may provide? So Coho has their own point system. So they are, you actually get pretty strong cash back. And once you sign up, you get your own referral too. that. I think like when somebody else joins, you both get extra cash back or you both get like an incentive. Um, so you can actually get, I think like one to 3% at least on Coho purchases, which is nice. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so, so much, Mallory and Josh. And thank you so much to everyone that joined us today. Um, we'd like to extend, like I just said, a big thank you to Mal and Josh. And we really enjoyed learning from you folks today. That was super helpful. And like I mentioned before, we will send you the um, slideshow that they shared with us today. And again, thank you everyone who joined us. And the AC Hub and the Students Association, we host a variety of different student events every month. And for more information about those events, please check out our events calendar, which we'll share in links next.
our links to in the chat now and be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter. And thank you so much everyone for joining us. Thank you, Mallory and Josh, that was so informative. And uh, we really look forward to seeing you all at our next event. So thank you everyone. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. Bye folks. Bye, thank you.